multimedia studio so that we're having this uh, uh, dialogue. Uh, this dialogue series actually is a part of uh, CCG China and the World Webinar Series that we launched in uh, last year in an effort to engage the uh, uh, prominent uh, scholars, experts, government advisors, business leaders uh, to continue exchange at this uh, uh, pandemic, of course, also difficult, challenging time. Uh, that uh, we are really uh, very uh, fortunate we had uh, Professor Graham Allison with us. So th uh, this section we are hosting <laughs> uh, Professor Graham Allison. And of course, Professor Graham Allison is a world-renowned political and political scientist and a leading strategist in the US national security and defense policy with special interest in nuclear arms control, uh, geopolitical competition, and also strategic decision making. Uh, he always uh, in, at the front of the world affairs and has been a leading voice on issues like uh, US-Soviet uh, relations, uh, China rising, Sino-US relations, uh, terrorism, and also uh, uh, Cuba crisis, Middle East, and of course also uh, on the changing international uh, uh, society, of course. Uh, so Graham Allison is also a Douglas Dillon professor at, of the government at the Harvard Kennedy School, where he has taught for five decades. Uh, Allison is, of course, is the uh, founding dean of the uh, Harvard Kennedy School. And uh, uh, also he was there until 2017, uh, where he served as also a director of its Belfer Center uh, for Science and uh, International Affairs, which ranked uh, number one a university think tank in the world. Uh, he also, uh, as Assistant Secretary of Defense in the first Clinton administration, uh, Dr. Allison received the Defense Department highest civilian award, the Defense Medal for Distinguished Public Service for reshaping relations with Russian, Ukraine, Belarus, and uh, Kazakhstan for the peace uh, uh, the movement there. So as a founding dean, actually, uh, of the modern Kennedy School, uh, uh, under his leadership from 1977 to 1989, a small uh, uh, undefined program uh, grew into 20-fold or maybe 30-fold, become a major professional school of public policy and the government. I've been really also uh, uh, very honored to have uh, spent a, a year as a senior fellow at Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, we had many exchanges with uh, Professor Graham. And it was really a fond memory. And also I know how, how many uh, also Chinese uh, uh, policy uh, decision makers has been uh, a scholar there and also has a great uh, program which has actually uh, uh, many Chinese uh, leaders and actually uh, provincial municipality leaders have also uh, gone through the uh, training at the Harvard Kennedy School. But also as an assistant secretary of defense and the president kingdom and special advisor, uh, to the Secretary of Defense and President Reagan, Graham has been a member of the uh, Secretary of Defense Advisory Board for every secretary since uh, Weinberg to Matis. So he's, uh, he's well known, he's uh, uh, quite frequently consulted. He has the sole distinction of having twice been awarded a Distinguished Public Service Medal, first by Secretary Cap, Cap Weinberg, Casper Weinberg, and also second by Secretary Bill Perry. So that's very unique. He has served on the advisory board of the Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, and Director of CIA. So Graham Allison also is the organizer of the Commission's Americans' National Interest and a founding member of a Trilateral Commission, a Director of Council of Foreign Relations, and has been a member of public com committees and commissions, along, along them with the Bay Carter. DOE Task Force for Non-Proliferation Program with Russia, uh, the IAEA's Commission for Imminent Persons, and the Commission for Prevention of Weapons of Mass Destruction, Proliferation, and Terrorism. So you can see... His, so this his, is more, more than enough, Henry. How okay. about we do the topic? <laughs> okay, so, so I think that's probably, uh, that's probably enough there. And he's, uh, he's famous for his book, actually, uh, Destiny for War, Can American and China Escape His Trap? Uh, published in 2017. Uh, I had actually had the honor of, uh, of his two books uh, 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 as, as well. I mean, he has uh, uh, actually give a talk at uh, Center for China and Globalization uh, in 2017. 
uh, that uh, for his uh, very uh, uh, well-known book, and uh, we had a very good uh, discussion then uh, for his uh, very uh, uh, profound uh, thinking there. And also, uh, uh, you, 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 you were at uh, uh, Munich Security Conference, actually, just last year we met you there, you had a very good uh, 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 you know, talk and, uh, at the Munich Security Conference. So, so I think that uh, the discussion we're having today is really uh, uh, fascinating. We, we, the topic of today is the destiny for rivalry partnership, U.S.-China competition, <laughs> which in a changing reality. I, I think it's really uh, fascinating we have this. So uh, uh, we also have uh, another uh, uh, distinguished uh, uh, scholar that Professor Li Chen actually is with us. Uh, Li Chen is a social professor and director for Center of International Security and Strategic at the School of International Studies at Renmin University of China. And his research interests include strategic and diplomatic history, contemporary security and military strategy, and US-China security relations, on which he has published uh, scholar articles in leading journals, uh, such as Journal of Strategic Studies, China Military Science, and various public policy briefings. He's uh, also a frequent participant of the, uh, 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 also a various track to dialogue on Asia Pacific security. And he's also a non-resident fellow of Center for International Security and Strategic at the Tsinghua University. He got his PhD from University of Cambridge 2013, and he has a master from Peking University. So we have a young scholar uh, uh, joining us actually today. So uh, let's, let's, let's begin, uh, Graham, uh, of our uh, discussion today. And, uh, I noticed that you've been really uh, widely uh, consulted uh, lately on uh, uh, many, many occasions, so, so really a great uh, opportunity for you to join us. And, and we, we noticed now, this is also a very interesting time, that uh, President Biden has uh, assumed the uh, office for probably less than 100 days now, and, uh, but he actually basically proposed, uh, uh, you know, he, he famous now said, okay, let's have, have a competition but let's also have a co cooperation. Uh, but also uh, for Mr. Wang Yi uh, of China, you know, state councilor, also said the NPC section that China recognized there's a competition, but also we can have a cooperation. So uh, I think President Biden and President Xi had a very long uh, 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 two hours telephone call at the Chinese New Year that uh, both president uh, has uh, expressed the desire. They are seeking no confrontation. Uh, but uh, but uh, uh, you know maybe cooperation uh, if uh, if uh, whenever possible. So so in your uh, book, I mean first we we'll probably talk to the book. In your, in your book, destined for war, can America and China escape his trap? It's become a, a <laughs> famous question now. Uh, Everybody is uh, is aware. And in that book, actually, uh, 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 the Greek historian he 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 wrote he said. It was the rise of Athens and the fear of that is instilled, instilled in Spartan that make war inevitable. So, uh, so now I, I, I know that you'll be keeping track of this uh, topic and uh, uh, it's been quite a few years now since you published his book. So you think can American and China escape his trap? And <laughs> maybe that's the first uh, uh, important question that I, I will really uh, get your advice on that. Maybe you can give us here some new, new thinking on that as well. Uh, Professor Graham. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I don't think probably we should just post the resumes since otherwise we don't have enough time to talk. But I think uh, uh, I've long argued that Chinese should be much more forthcoming in helping all of us appreciate more of uh, what uh, Xi Jinping now calls Chinese wisdom. And actually I've applauded the fact that he's been now more forward leaning about the idea that maybe Chinese have learned some things that the rest of us could learn from. So I'm eager uh, to hear what Chen Li and uh, others have to say on the topic. But I, uh, I, I have a pretty good idea of what I think, but I'm trying to uh, become clearer about the way forward. So let me make three points just to start with. First point, for those who may not remember Thucydides trap and the Thucydidean rivalry, the first point 
which I make in my book and which I would urge you to, to think about if you haven't had a chance to look at it, uh, is that the defining feature of the relationship between the U.S. and China today and for as far ahead as any eye can see will be a ruthless rivalry. So in uh, a competition in which a rising China, which is seeking to make China great again, will continue as it has for a generation, rising and becoming stronger. And as it does so, will be encroaching on positions and prerogatives that Americans as the ruling power have come to believe are naturally their own as number one at the top of every pecking order. So if we put this against a historical, the canvas of history, the best way to clarify what's actually happening in this relationship is that China is rising, and as long as China doesn't crash or crack up, it will continue rising. So currently it has about a quarter the per capita GDP of the US, but of course it has four times as many people. So on the current trajectory, why shouldn't Chinese be as productive as South Koreans? Which of course they will be. And if they were, China would have more than half the per capita GDP of the U.S. But then it would have a GDP twice the size of the U.S. So as China rises in every arena, Americans who've become accustomed to believing we are number one in every competition will find themselves being overtaken, even surpassed. So beginning of the century, America was the major trading partner of everybody. 2021, China is the major trading partner of almost everybody. A generation ago, America was the manufacturing workshop of the world. Today, China is the manufacturing workshop of the world. So in the structural realities is a rising China that's impacting a ruling US. And I compare this in my book to like a seesaw of power in which as China gets stronger and wealthier and more powerful, inevitably, that's the nature of a Thucydidean rivalry, that that rise shifts the, the tectonics of power, the seesaw of power between the rising power and the ruling power. So that's point one. And I think that I know many Chinese colleagues have not wanted to accept the proposition saying, well, China not really rising, it's already risen, or China is different. Or I would say, best way to think about it, this is another instance of a pattern that we've seen since Thucydides wrote about Athens and, and Sparta. And that in my book, I find 16 instances of just in the last 500 years. So this has happened for a long time. That's point one. Point two, equally important. We now live in the 21st century where the objective conditions in the 21st century have condemned the U.S. and China to coexist since the only option is to co-destruct. So two arenas here. First, nuclear weapons. We learned in the Cold War and Chen Li is a serious student of the Cold War. I'm an old Cold Warrior. We learned very painfully when the Soviet Union acquired a robust nuclear arsenal that was capable of a second strike that we lived in a mad world, it was called, mutual assured destruction. So that meant that if, we, if one attacked the other, at the end of the story, both would be destroyed. So this is like a mutual suicide pact, or I've compared it to two inseparable conjoined twins. 
in which if one gives way to its impulses in dealing with the other and strangles it, it will succeed in killing its twin, but it will commit suicide. So that's the nuclear piece. And that's true in the relationship between the US and China today, even though the US has a much larger nuclear arsenal, it's still the case that if there were a full-scale nuclear war, end of the war, America is destroyed. So that's mutual assured destruction. We also have in the 21st century, we understand climate in which greenhouse gas emissions by China, which is the number one emitter, or the US, which is the number two emitter, are emitted into the same contained biosphere and can either by themselves create an environment in which neither can live. So we have a kind of an analog, um, a climate med. And in addition, we're both so entangled in a global process of globalization and a global economy that no one can decouple himself from this without impoverishing himself. So on the one hand, we're gonna be fierce rivals. On the other hand, we're, we're, we're condemned by nature and by technology to cooperate in order to survive. So how about these two contradictory ideas at the same time? And that's why in searching for ways to escape Thucydides trap, I found very interesting the bit of Chinese wisdom as best I can understand it in the Song Dynasty. So this is back a thousand years ago, when in 1005, the Song, having found themselves unable to defeat the Liao, a northern Mongol tribe, negotiated the Chanyan Treaty, in which, as some historians have called it, they agreed to become rivalry partners. So they had defined areas in which they would continue to be rivals, but they had other areas in which they were thickly cooperating. In fact, it was a very peculiar arrangement because even though the Liao agreed that the Song were the major dynasty, the tribute actually flowed from the Song to the Liao. So the Song were paying the Liao, but the deal was the Liao had then to take whatever tribute, tribute was paid and use it to buy things from the Song. So you had actually an early version of the multiplier effect in, in economics. And this treaty, uh, which I know many Chinese don't like because for whatever reason, the Song dynasty is not, I think, appreciated sufficiently. That's from my poor man's view of Chinese history. So apologies for that. But in any case, from my perspective, since I'm interested in not having war, this Chanyan Treaty preserved a peace between the Song and the Liao for 120 years. So I would say in the annals of history, a treaty that takes two parties who are in fierce rivalry and manages a hundred years of peace between them has done a pretty good thing. Uh, thank you, thank you, uh, uh, Graham, for your <laughs> a great uh, uh, illustration of, of your point. I, I, mean, I think that you, you talk about this uh, Hedis uh, trap, but, uh, but I really liked uh, your, your twin uh, uh, metaphor, the twin comparison, that we are now actually in a much more intertwined world. We are, we are actually inseparable. It's a, it's a twin uh, relationship. So if we, uh, you know, we, we have to work together in fighting climate change and, uh, and all the uh, other challenges, uh, pandemic and, uh, and all those things. So if we are really, uh, separate, we we'll end up uh, both dying. So, so that that is a great uh, matter for this twin uh, uh, relationship. But, but also, you you mentioned about uh, this uh, historical uh, 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 last five hundred years. You have summarized all those uh, 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 you know sixteen uh, incident were were full of them actually end up uh, uh, peacefully. So, so, so I know that uh, 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 Professor Lee is uh, is. Uh, uh, a military uh, uh, strategist, a researcher, actually. Uh, I think that uh, uh, Graham has mentioned about this uh, uh, 
uh, this Song Liao uh, in, in, uh, in the Chinese history, uh, where the Chang Yuan uh, uh, agreement uh, between the two uh, parties actually secured uh, uh, a peace for almost uh, one or 200 years, and uh, they have a, a 380 <laughs> representative exchanges during this 100, 200 years. So, so that, there is a possibility that, uh, uh, that we can maintain this peace. So perhaps uh, uh, Professor Lee can, can, can uh, share a bit of your ideas how we can avoid this uh, Hihidu's trap, uh, uh, either China or internationally, uh, that, based on your research on that. Okay, uh, thank, okay, thank you, Huiyao, and uh, thank you, Graham. And uh, I want to have a few comments on Graham's uh, remarks. And uh, firstly, I think uh, with regard to the, both the concept of the rising power and uh, rising power and r ruling powers, I think uh, in particular for the experience of both the rise of the U.S in the 19th century or early 20th century and uh, the rise of China, China in the last 70 years, I think the most important factor is home front. That is, uh, uh, we, um, we need to concentrate our effort on economic development at, at home and also solving our, our social problems. So I think this is one of the most important lessons. And my second point is that uh, with regard to the challenge of grid power competition and the risk of the grid power competition, I totally with Graham that during the Cold War, the nuclear weapons uh, is extremely dangerous. And uh, I think in the 21st century, we, we also have other new technological challenges such as cyber and uh, mm, because uh, our daily life uh, depend on cyber, everyone know that. And uh, if the grid power competition escalates, I think we will face serious challenges in the cyber domain. So we need to uh, manage this competition uh, very carefully. And my third point is, is about the relationship between Leo and the Song, uh, as mentioned by Graham. And uh, I have two points here. I think the po uh, first point is that um, probably we need to have a long-term perspective because the Song Leo experience is a long piece after the long war. So I think both sides learn plenty of lessons from that Long, uh, long wars, uh, at least 30 years. So probably one challenge for the 21st century is that we can't have a long war first and then a long peace because it, it will be very uh, uh, disruptive to all the sides. And my second point is that why did the Song and the Liao have the long, pe long peace? Uh, because they realized that you can't rely on force to solve all of your problems. And at the same time, you have uh, other concerns such as other uh, external challenges. And also you need to uh, focus on your home front as I just mentioned. So these are my uh, response to Graham's ideas. Thank you. Can I, okay. can I ask Chen Li one question, please? Sure, yes. So uh, uh, Chen Li, in, in your looking at the uh, uh, Song and their relationship with the Liao. Is this a special case in Chinese history or are there some analogs that are quite, you know, that you would regard as similar from which we might also learn, you know, something? I think uh, probably uh, from the experience of the Asian China, I think the major dynasties, uh, not only Song, but also Han Dynasty and uh, other dynasties, I think they uh, they try to improve the, their policies to maintain peace uh, with uh, all the uh, all the entities. Uh, so I think probably we can find other uh, other uh, period of peace in other major dynasties uh, like the Han uh, Han Dynasty. As well, so I think uh, uh, this is a very in interesting areas for, uh, for for our uh, our re research, and uh, so, so I think probably we can learn more from you because you pay more attention to to about the, to the lessons from the ancient history on contemporary 
history uh, or current affairs. Uh, so I think probably we need more cooperation between the historians who work on Asian Chinese history and uh, an expert who work on current affairs. Well, in, in the U.S., there are many, uh, as you know, uh, and in, in, in England where you study, there are many uh, people who study Chinese dynasties. And actually, I mean, it's fascinating because it's such a long history and there's, it's so complex. So for a poor person like me who doesn't speak Mandarin and comes late to the party, it's staggering to try to think of, you know, U.S., I, I have trouble thinking of 300 years of history. So for 3,000 or more, there's so many twists and, and turns. But I think it's a very rich uh, body of experience <clears throat> that ought to be processed for, you know, for lessons. And I think Chinese historians obviously are advantaged in that, but there are many people in the West interested. So I, I hope you you and your colleagues dig in further, since I only by accident, I guess, I maybe was somebody you introduced me to, actually, when I was at Rimen once, told me about the Song and the Liao as an example. But I bet you there's more examples that I just haven't found. Yeah. Yeah, th thanks, Graham, and, and also Chen. I think, yeah, actually, in the, in the history of China, probably there's many examples of uh, of China not, uh, uh, you know, the, the, they avoided the fight and then they secured the peace. And even actually, in the, you know, not too long ago, even, uh, uh, you know, when, when Zheng He actually, uh, you know, the uh, 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 envoy actually take a six time uh, expedition, uh, go as far as to Africa and Southeast Asia. Seven times they actually go, 100 years before Columbus <laughs> discovered America. They have, haven't really started any war and then the security peace gave a lot of gifts to, the, uh, to those local, local uh, other countries. So you can see that historically China is a, a, a peace lobby, never actually still now haven't sent a soldier uh, to occupy any territory. I just read actually uh, an article from uh, from China Daily, from Kishu Mahabadi, which is also uh, your friend, Graham. He yeah. was saying that China's renaissance uh, is probably, uh, you know, the history of China is helping uh, China to, to probably uh, reshape a bit of, the, of contemporary history. Because we do have a common uh, threats like climate change, like a pandemic, like all those others. So, so I think it's probably that when we face the common threat, then we probably really has to act as a twin and has to work together. Uh, now, uh, I'd like to also uh, follow up uh, for, for uh, uh, another question that, uh, 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 Graham, your, your recent foreign affairs article uh, called for Biden administration to adopt an unsentimental China policy. So, so how do you think about uh, U.S.-China rivalry uh, based on structural uh, uh, changes or structural differences or something more complicated? And, uh, and maybe a combination of the fear, value, psychological uh, different, or, or, or uh, uh, ideological difference, or clash of civilizations. So uh, can we really uh, uh, do something on that? Right. Well, I think the, the good news in, uh, about Biden <clears throat> is that he's somebody who's well-grounded and has thought about uh, international affairs for you know, all of his adult life. He... Uh, as I've known him for now more than four decades. Uh, he uh, has been in the Senate. He's been the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee. He's been vice president. He and Xi Jinping have probably spent more time together than any other leaders uh, other than Putin uh, or before that Lee Kuan Yew. So, but they... They understand each other. So when they had this phone call, they're not starting from scratch. They're building on a relationship that's developed over it. And I think <clears throat> President Biden appreciates the fact that what I, I've, I've said, written about it, that the challenge is to uh, the Gatsby challenge. So in the great Gatsby, Scott Fitzgerald writes, the test of a first-class mind is the ability to hold two 
contradictory ideas in your head at the same time and still function. So idea one, this is going to be a fierce competition because both the U.S. and China are determined to whatever extent they can to be the biggest economy, the smartest economy, the best AI, the best military, the biggest trading partner, the fastest whatever. So when the Olympics occur, each will field a team and each will be seeking to win as much gold as it can. That's that's what's the Olympics. And uh, uh, that's on the one hand. On the other hand, at the same time, and somewhat in contradiction with the first, is the fact that unless the U.S. and China can find ways to coordinate and cooperate in dealing with climate, we can create a biosphere nobody can live in. Unless the U.S. and China can find a way to cooperate to make sure third-party actions like some set of events over Taiwan or North Korea or an incident doesn't spiral out of control, we could end up in a war. And if we ended up in a real full-scale war, we could end up destroying both societies. I mean, that most most people can't 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 imagine what that means. But as an old cold warrior who used to look at target charts and just you know c- calculate the destructive effects, it could literally be the case that if we had a full scale nuclear war between China and the U.S., both China and the U.S. would be wiped off the map. They'd simply be gone as countries. Well, that's inconceivable. I mean, no no human being could make sense of something that grotesque, but that's the physical capability of the weapons that exist. So we are compelled to cooperate to avoid sequences of events that could produce that result, to avoid letting unconstrained greenhouse gas emissions create a create a, 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 a globe we can't live, we can't breathe in. So how to do these two things at the same time and how actually to explain that in the politics of both countries, which are both complicated because uh, Americans look at China and say, my God, how could China be rivaling us on all these fronts? I mean, we remember when China was small and poor and backward and a developing country. And Chinese, when they watch Anchorage or other events, if I will listen to what I can tell from, or, you know, the read of people who watch, who, who read China's social media, say, enough of this. We don't need to have Americans lecturing us anymore. We become bigger and stronger. We need to be more assertive. So managing the, 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 the internal affairs of two great powers in which I think Xi Jinping and Biden may be able to hold two contradictory ideas and function, but how can they manage their governments and their societies under these conditions? I, that's a problem I've been working on, but I don't have too many good ideas. Okay, okay, great. Uh, thank you. I, I like the, uh, the idea you said, uh, the, the Olympic <laughs> game spirit, you know, if we can conduct a, a peaceful uh, a competition where we all strike for go, uh, gold medals and maybe we have a, a win-win situation and then maybe, you know, that uh, we, if we can, uh, you know, we, we measure the country by KPI, by, by their domestic performance, that's probably a, a more uh, effective way of saying, you know, it's a kind of a Deng Xiaoping's idea of it doesn't matter as a white cat, black cat, <laughs> as long as it catches mice. So, so we can really avoid this, uh, uh, I pick your problem, you pick my problem, and then we are not really uh, concentrated on solving our own problems. So, so, so this kind of Olympic game uh, the spirit, uh, uh, you know, higher, <laughs> faster, and, uh, and quicker is, is really 
uh, suitable, I think, for this uh, Paris and comparison of, uh, of sign and U.S. relation. I'm actually still, I want to review uh, the, the 12 cues you, you mentioned uh, in your destiny for war. Uh, can America and, and China escape this trap? Uh, these 12 points uh, that uh, uh, we, we, have, uh, uh, we have actually uh, 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 you know, read in your book. I think a lot of them still uh, uh, quite, quite true, uh, even though you have proposed them quite, quite a few years ago. And uh, 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 so, so, uh, so I'd like to share that. Uh, uh, for, for example, you talk about uh, high authority can help resolve a rivalry without a war, means maybe international uh, higher organization. And, and, and the second, the states can be embedded in a large economic, political, and security institutions that constrain historical normal behavior. So, so that's also virtual for the contemporary world where we, all the countries are now have a larger, more uh, economic and political and security uh, uh, institution to, 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 country, uh, to control uh, us, uh, our behavior now. And third is that the wheelie statesmen uh, uh, make a virtue of necessity and distinguish uh, needs and wants. So that's another uh, good coup. And also force, time is crucial. Absolutely, we are, we are in a, such a critical timing and uh, uh, for, the, for the whole world to, to, to know where we're going to head for the next 75 years uh, after this worldwide uh, virus war. And, and the fifth, the cultural commonality can help prevent a conflict. We have a globalization. We have a globalizing culture as well. So, so we are actually seeing a bit more of that. So can we really deepen that uh, to prevent the conflict. Also six, you said there's nothing new under the sun except the nuclear weapons. Of course, the, the, the nuclear weapons is a strong deterrent uh, for us not to uh, you know, do anything. As you said, it's mutually assured destructive. Absolutely uh, not possible. So, so mad, mutually assured destructive does make all the world uh, madness, uh, which is a, a, a very sound advice. And number eight, you said the hot war between the nuclear superpowers it's just no longer a justifiable op 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 option, which is true, you know, because uh, if China and the U.S. all have a nuclear arsenal, and if they really, uh, anything trigger that, as you said, you know, there's a lot of conflict. If one conflict uh, is out of control, we got the whole world destroyed, then that's really, uh, uh, you know, I mean, China now has more, uh, uh, more liability, more high rises, more, <laughs> more fixed assets probably than the U.S. now we have, we have uh, two thirds of global highway, uh, also uh, fast train networks, uh, dams, uh, bridges. I mean, you know, there's, it's really uh, not good for the U.S. too. You know, U.S. has all those uh, uh, beautiful uh, country you have. So uh, we, we should avoid that. And then number nine is that leaders of nuclear superpowers must nonetheless be prepared uh, to risk a war that cannot win. So, so, so that's really, you know, we have to have the global uh, coordination and, and really preventing that. That maintains the thick economic interdependence, raise the cost, and thus lower the likelihood of the war. I think that's very, very true because uh, China has a per capita of uh, uh, over 10,000 GDP, US has a per capita of 6,000 GDP. Uh, uh, you know, we are all getting relatively rich now, and uh, we don't want to fight a war. I mean, uh, nobody wants to do that. So, so you're absolutely right. And the number 11 is alliance can be a fatal. Uh, uh, attraction uh, uh, and 12 domestic performance is decisive. You're, you're saying that domestic performance is decisive, which is also correct. I mean, we should all focus on the domestic uh, uh, decisive on that, uh, which is, uh, you know, measure the country of its people's support. And to, uh, for example, China lived 800 million people out of poverty. Uh, that's probably the biggest human right development in China. So, so those things I think are really still, uh, uh, you know, largely true. And uh, I don't know if you have anything to add on that, or Professor Lee have anything to add on that. Maybe uh, Professor Lee has 12 points. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, we can add, add, build on your 12 points, and then we can expand that, probably. Mm. OK, uh, so uh, I think uh, uh, probably I was uh, uh, um, say a few things uh, as mentioned by Graham probably in his early on comments. So because Graham uh, is convinced that uh, leaders of the two countries, I think are determined to uh, the, to manage the competition. And uh, and he just said he is not sure whether the societies and the public opinions of the two sides will do so. I think uh, probably one 
A positive lesson of the Cold War is that we have two periods. The first is the mobilization of the、um, both sides. At that time, we were、uh, probably you are hopeful about the force, and uh, uh, you probably believe that. Uh, pressure will work, but I think later on, both sides realize that pressures and、uh, force have limitations, and、uh, so I think then they pass the mobilization period of the great power competition, and they enter a new period of detente or stabilize. Period. So I think the key point here is that if we can manage、uh, crisis、uh, very carefully, and、uh, then we reveal the lessons of the competition, and、uh, and not only the leaders but also the ordinary citizens and the and public opinion will realize that in in the long term competition we need to talk with each other. Uh, 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 uh. Talk with each other and also cooperate with each other, not only to maintain peace but also to solve problems.、Uh, and、uh, Graham also mentioned uh, uh, the the important factor of、um, of other parties here. And、uh, I think、uh, so. Even during a long term great power competition, we need to work. With both sides and with other parties to try to、uh, establish some security orders to accommodate all the、uh, interests, all the crucial interests of everyone. So I think this is why in the 1970s and in the 1980s, Cold War in Europe become. Boring than 1940s and、uh, 50s when we witness plenty of crises. So、uh, these are my ideas. Thank you. Well, I, I think that I, I agree very much. And in the,、uh, I both discuss a little bit in Destined for War, but it's also a topic that I've studied for a long time. The Cold War, as you've been studying it, I think very effectively. So in the in the Cold War, it gets started with the idea that these are two systems inherently so incompatible that one will have to destroy the other, and that that would normally lead to war, but initially because the U.S. and the Soviet Union are both exhausted from World War II. And then, eventually, because they both acquired nuclear arsenals, they conclude that's not an option. So, therefore, well, how about we have a war? Quote, but don't use bombs and bullets by uniformed、uh, combatants. And in that Cold War, so called, there early on emerged a, a set of constraints. Some of which were implicit, some of which were explicit, and then eventually, we discovered that we would have to coordinate and constrain, but also communicate very thickly, and even cooperate in order to prevent things getting out of control. So I think the the lessons from that set of ex- experiences, even though the current、uh, Rivalry between the U.S. and China are very different. Nonetheless, can be very instructive. And I think, for example, I was doing something on this with people in Washington last week, and is explaining to them, even in the deadliest era or days of the Cold War, we were keen to have thick conversations and communication between the president and the president. So Reagan. Would often be criticized by his conservative Republican colleagues for why he wanted to spend so much time talking to his Soviet counterparts, and he said it's very important to talk to them because a nuclear war cannot be won, so must therefore never be fought. He was keen to negotiate with his Soviet counterpart, even to reach arms control agreements in which the U.S. Would forego doing something Americans wanted to do, 
as the price for getting the Soviet Union to forego things we did not want them to do. And in every one of those cases, there was a problem of trust. And so you would only agree on things that you could independently verify. But there, um, th this process over time stabilized to a degree, as you point out, and, and made it possible to avoid lots of potential crises that could have spun out of control and that almost did in the Berlin crisis or in the Cuban Missile Crisis. So I think there's no reason why in the rivalry between the U.S. and China, we shouldn't pick up and dust off and adapt all of the lessons that were learned from the earlier period about the necessity for communication at many levels, for thick communication, for crisis management procedures, even for crisis prevention procedures. So I, I think that would be actually a big addition, Henry, that uh, Chen Li and his work and those of others might add to the, you know, to the list for avoiding uh, uh, being sucked into the vortex of a Thucydidean and dynamic that could ultimately drag us into a war. Great, and uh, uh, thank you both, and uh, uh, also Graham for for you actually uh, add some new thinking on that. I think it's a great idea of crisis management. Uh, you, you you mentioned about during the, the Cold War, even uh, U.S. and uh, Soviet Union has such a fierce uh, competition. They still maintain high level dialogue. I remember also there was a kitchen debate <laughs> even. Uh, at that time between uh, Khrushchev and, and also Nixon there. So, uh, and also, uh, uh, I, I think this, uh, uh, you know, kind of Olympic uh, a game uh, a competition, peaceful competition among the countries, like Thomas Friedman actually mentioned in his New York Times saying, you know, China is doing an Olympic uh, uh, where, uh, of the country level so that maybe the world can have a, a peaceful competi competition for that. I have an idea for that. I think you, you, you're absolutely right. You know, why we have a common uh, pressure, uh, a necessity to work together, like this pandemic, uh, we have to fight together. But also I noticed that uh, President Biden just uh, a week ago announced this massive, gigantic uh, infrastructure plan for the US, uh, which is enormous. And, uh, and also China has been able to uh, develop very well on the infrastructure front. So, um, you know, China has set up a, a, a Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. So probably we need some new Britain Wood moment and then maybe we can add on, can we uh, work with US to, to, to build up a, a world infrastructure investment bank so that we can really have some common interest to work on with US and to, uh, uh, to build up larger pies to share and to, to distribute so that we don't have to really fight, right? I mean, we have some large interest to draw us into that. Uh, that's one uh, recommendation that I can think of. The second recommendation I can think of uh, to add on your list is that uh, uh, you uh, you'd mentioned about uh, EU as well. I mean, EU actually is, uh, I, I don't see the EU as a problem. EU actually, if you talk about EU as a whole, is probably the, the largest economy in the world. And uh, they have uh, also a rising also <laughs> in the last uh, 75 years and then they don't have a problem with the huge trap with the US. And then probably they could be in a more uh, a third part position. So, so like a, like a romance of three kingdoms that they can be a mediator uh, a, a power between China and the US. So maybe you could have a, some mm -hmm. kind of tri-party uh, talks so that they can really be a good middleman to really <laughs> avoid the, the, the conflict between US and, and China. The other thing I can think of is actually, um, I, I, I read, uh, I read uh, Richard Haas, uh, the, the head of our Council of Foreign Relations. He, he just wrote in the Foreign Affairs on the, um, March 23rd this year. He's saying the, the, the global multilateral global system is on the crossroad and that the world will be uh, ending the two century Western domination. Uh, domination. So, uh, so actually, uh, Western domination not only going to probably uh, uh, diminish a bit, uh, not only uh, materially but also ideologically. 
he was really thinking of uh, the European, European 19th century coordination mechanism. So he was saying that uh, probably we have a, uh, the world needs a new world uh, coordination mechanism. And he proposed uh, six country uh, co coordination like US, China, EU, Japan, India, and Russia. So that they will have this uh, a, a new international uh, country coordination mechanism, regardless of ideology and everything. So those are maybe things we can we can think of, and uh, uh, he may have a, 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 a idea there too. And actually, uh, I noticed also uh, your 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 grand friend uh, uh, Henry Kissinger, Dr. Kissinger, mentioned uh, at the Chatham House recently. He was also at the China Development Forum that. Uh, uh, the, the final issue between China and U.S. is uh, Western countries, if they can reach an understanding, you know, if, uh, uh, if they can reach an understanding with China. If not, it's, it's almost like, a, uh, you know, on the eve of the First World War and uh, where, uh, you know, it, this, this issue is very dangerous, then we'll be, if we lose control, we'll be <laughs> destroyed each other. So, 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 so I would like to hear... Uh, uh, you know, uh, you 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 think of um, you know Richard Hess and maybe uh, Henry Kissinger and all those good ideas. So how we can find common things to work together, also to accept China because uh, I found that uh, you know no matter China is doing right on many fronts, but it was not accepted. So China is doing well on the infrastructure, on on uh, poverty regulation, and contribute over one third of the global GDP growth. China contributed over fifty percent last year during the pandemic. But those are not 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 uh, not uh, appreciated probably by the Western countries. How can we uh, re reconcile that? Well, I'm good. I, you've obviously been thinking about it, so this is good, <laughs> and I like your list. So, for infrastructure, I think it's interesting that if you look at the Biden infrastructure bill, uh, one of my Chinese friends to me said, "This is called the American version of." China 2025. So in part, it's inspired by Xi Jinping's earlier version. The other thing I would say about this uh, half in jest, for those of you who haven't seen my TED talk on Thucydides Trap, uh, I have in it a great graphic picture of the contrast between Chinese infrastructure and American infrastructure. Uh, and with the proposal that the Chinese could teach the Americans many lessons here. And I compare two bridges. First, the bridge outside my office that grows across the Charles River between the Kennedy School and the Business School, and a bridge in Beijing, which has three times as many lanes of traffic, which was also renovated. And you could guess how long each of them took, but you won't believe it until you see it. So I would say, go look at it. It's a just a, it's a 17 minute clip. You can go to the middle and, and find it. It takes about two minutes, but it's hard to believe. So the US could learn a lot from China in infrastructure development. In the period in which the US was building one, one, high-speed rail going from a mint to go from uh, Los Angeles to, to Sacramento and actually got into it $85 billion worth and gave up. China built 12,000 miles of high-speed rail. So there's a lot the U.S. could learn on the infrastructure front. The EU and the three bar three bar problem or the three kingdoms. That's very interesting. I have to think more about that. Well, the new concert that Richard was arguing about, I think basically a lot of people have taken this analog to what happened at the Congress of Vienna and the concert of Europe. But I think the differences between circumstances today and then are so much more substantial than the similarities. That is a not very not a very helpful analogy. And then for for Henry, whom I talk to a lot about this, he believes that if the competition is totally unconstrained, if we're not able to develop some both implicit and explicit constraints on the competition, particularly in the areas 
where cooperation is necessary for our survival, that the outcome will be catastrophic. I agree with that. So, I mean, I think the place to start is Thucydides and rivalry that most often leads in catastrophic destruction. That's insane. That'd be insane for China, insane for the U.S. So the imperative for all of us is to find a way to escape Thucydides' trap. And that's why looking everywhere we can, rivalry partnership in the Song Dynasty or lessons from the Cold War or lessons from the period is as Chun Li said, when the U.S. rose to rival Britain, wherever we can find these, you know, lessons, I think we should be all out actively pursuing them and collecting them. And I think, fortunately, we have both in Xi Jinping, who gets this completely. I mean, he, he says, why do we need a new form of great power relations? Because we know what happens in the old form, the two city and dynamic. Biden understands this very well. What are we worried about? He's worried about this being an unconstrained rivalry that ends up with a catastrophic outcome. So I think we have a, an open, you know, open door for ideas if we have any very good ideas. So that's why I applaud your, you know, trying to stir this pot. And I think that I, I think there's many, many more Chinese scholars and policy relevant people who've maybe been a little too shy in coming forth with more ideas. So I'm hoping your center will, you know, collect more because yes. for ignorant people like me who only read English, so I can't read their stuff in Mandarin. It, I think you may be able to, you know, be an intermediary here. Great, uh, thank you, thank you for your, for your uh, encouragement, uh, Graham. Uh, I, I think that you're absolutely right. We we want to collect as many as possible, including uh, Professor Lee's of, of course, ideas of how we can uh, reconcile the the the, the uh, differences and how can we really uh, find uh, ways to escape escape uh, he this trap. Uh, and another idea would be this. Um, of course, we have uh, the CPTPP, which is TPP designed by the U.S. for higher standards of. Uh, uh, trade and uh, service trade and uh, IPR protection, digital economy, uh, SOE reform and uh, environmental protection and the labor rights and everything. So it's really a, a 21st century, uh, a mini WTO where U.S. actually first uh, uh, made that uh, uh, with uh, Obama and Biden administration. Uh, but now President Xi said that APEC summit, China is interested to join that. China is interested to come up with all the higher standards. So that would be a great area if U.S. and China come back and talk about that. And then so we can set a good example for the WTO reform. And then we can really push things forward. Uh, rather, you know, find a way to monetize our relations so that we don't have to really, uh, uh, on, on a bilateral front, uh, to, to, uh, to, to really have this conflict. So, so that's one thing. The other thing I'm, I'm, I'm quite encouraging is that uh, I noticed that President Biden has invited President Xi to attend this climate summit on the Earth Day on April 21st, which is you know three weeks from now, so that 40 heads of state uh, will be invited to, to uh, President Biden's uh, climate summit, regardless of uh, of ideology and uh, you know uh, country system, which is a great start. You know, so we, we let's tackle the, uh, the the issues confronting climate change is probably uh, you know that's a way. Really, maybe you could set up an international climate organization. So that we have, as you said, have more dialogues on all those from. Uh, so, so those would be really great. And I don't know if uh, Professor uh, Li Chen have uh, any ideas to add to how to avoid this uh, he hit his trap. Well, let me just make one quick oh, footnote, sure. if I could. I think that the fact that uh, Biden is eager to have Xi participate in the Earth Day event, that B Biden and Xi agreed that China and the U.S. would co-chair the G20 working group on climate and therefore the certainty that they're going to come up with some specific proposals for doing something by the October meeting of the G20 is evidence that they both appreciate this contradiction that they have to find ways to cooperate at the same time they're both featuring the competitive aspect of the relationship. So I would say... That, that suggests that 
you know, this is a not a crazy idea. Yeah. Yes, exactly. I think you're, you're absolutely right. There's there's a, there's a rivalry partnership now, but also competition, competition, uh, cooperation, competition together. Uh, right. You know, I mean, also China National Semiconductor Association has now set up a working group with American Semiconductor Association, which is a great. So we hope there will be more discussion like that. Maybe we can resume the consulates that shut down in Houston and Chengdu, and then we can, you know, have a few good example build trust, trust building on that. So, so, so really, I, I, I agree with you. We need to uh, seek more ideas of can we work together. Uh, but also, at the same time, we recognize there's a competition, but let's have an Olympic spirit, Olympic sportsmanship, and then have a peaceful cooperation, a competition on that. So Chen Li, probably you can add your, your idea on that. Okay, uh, so I think uh, uh, probably to avoid the trap is that probably we can pay more attention to the consequences of the trap. So I think probably uh, this is the advantages of the um, leaders and uh, people who who, uh, who in the early Cold War or mid Cold War, because those generation of people are very familiar with the appearance of the both the Second World War and uh, for the older generation, they were even familiar with the First World War. So they know what's the consequences of the uh, trap. And uh, I think later on, they also develop their ideas about the consequences of nuclear war. Uh, uh, but I think one challenge for people today, probably not for Graham, but for young people like me, is that we live in peace for so long. And uh, probably uh, some people are excited about uh, mm, progress uh, uh, of our countries, but uh, uh, probably we pay less attention to the consequences of uh, great power competition and uh, conflict. So I think in terms of, per per uh, of perceptions, we need to put more emphasis on the consequence of the trap in order to avoid the trap. And I think with regard to the uh, to, to the economic development, and Graham is very, very generous, said that the US need to learn, learn more from China. But my idea is that the US also have plenty of things uh, in its history to learn as well, in particular, for example, in the early 20th century, and even during the Second World War, that the US production, uh, uh, I think it's very impressive. So I think there are a few lessons here. One is the uh, business concentrate on professionalism. And the second is a better working relations among society, government, and, uh, and uh, business communities. And I think uh, actually China learned a lot from the U.S. business community and uh, the uh, the efficiencies of the U.S. government. I think in the uh, later part of the 10th, 20th century, and we also, uh, so I think probably open-minded about lessons from others is very important. Thank you. Great, thank you. Yeah, we have to learn from each other. We, we are living in the same planet. We have a lot of common uh, threats. A lot of common interest to work. So it's really totally different with the Cold War time and also the First and Second World War. We are now in a really common prosperity world, and uh, we we need to we need to compete with Mars and the, or other uh, outer space. Maybe maybe we will go to send uh, people into the into the space. Uh, maybe you know as Earthmen, as the Earth community, we really had to work together. Uh, so thank you, Grant, for, for taking all this time. Uh, finally, we have some questions. Because you are so popular here, we have a, over 1 million viewers online, 1 million uh, on different uh, social media, uh, watch us live. And uh, so, so we collected some uh, questions. And, uh, and uh, so I have some questions. Uh, one question from, uh, from Sohu.com, uh, which I think you answered part of that already. Can China and the U.S. avoid Hihiti's trap? We have another question from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, China Daily. Uh, with regard to current situation, uh, what's your suggestion for both government? Uh, uh, what's your comment on the China US Alaska meeting? Uh, you probably also uh, mentioned part of that, but you can comment again. I have another interesting uh, uh, question from uh, Guan Cha uh, uh, Media, which is based in Shanghai. And he said the article, uh, and and, and sensational uh, China policy, the case for putting vital interest in first, co-authored by you and uh, Dr. Fred Hu, published by Foreign Affairs on February uh, 18, has been translated by, 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 by their website. 
It begins with a paragraph written by the U.S. President Joe Biden's uh, senior Asia and advisor Kurt Campbell and the President National Security Advisor Jack Sullivan wrote in a foreign affair in 2019. The year of engagement with China has come to an end ceremonial close. So when it come to March, we saw a dramatic stance taking place in Alaska where China uh, uh, director Yang Jiu uh, uh, and also United, uh, said, uh, the United States does not have a qualification to say that it was wants to speak to China from a position of strength uh, in, rep in reply to Mr. Sullivan. Uh, not long after that, the phrase was quoted by President Putin of Russia in an interview. So the question from that uh, Grand Chart uh, Media is that, uh, from what position will Biden administration engage with China in the status quo? So he has a very long, <laughs> a very long uh, preparation for that. Uh, uh, there, there's another question also, uh, China Review News Agency. Uh, there are voices criticize China being more tough in its diplomacy. So what's in your opinion of China's diplomacy or foreign policy? And what, do, what influence do you think it will have on US-China relations? So comment on China foreign policy as well. So basically, uh, two or three questions. Uh, uh, I'm sorry that we run a little bit over time, yeah. Okay, let me try to just, uh, all of them are good questions. I won't do justice to any of them. I think the, uh, the Anchorage meeting, uh, both parties showed they're going to be tough with each other. They're going to be clear-eyed about their interests first, and that they're going to uh, lead with competition rather than cooperation or uh, engagement. So I would say that was pretty predictable, and it happened, and we are where we are. Uh, the fact that uh, immediately after, or even before, the U.S. and China had agreed to co-chair the G20 Working Group on Climate, helps you get a bigger picture. And the fact that Xi Jinping will be part of a conversation on Earth Day about climate, and that this is a, a process that's in motion that's almost certain. If I were betting, I'd bet three to one that the U.S. and China will come up with some specific proposals for doing something on the climate front before the G20 meeting. Because if we remember how we ever got the Paris Accord, it was because the U.S. and China first agreed they would do something. And then they put that to other countries as the baseline for other countries getting aboard. So I think at least in that arena where we understand the consequences, we're going to see cooperative activity because they're each compelled to do this for their own well-being. And I hope we find something analogous in the conversation about potential uh, uh, sparks that could trigger spirals of misunderstandings like Taiwan, like North Korea, like Iran currently. We're actually, interestingly, again, the P5 plus one conversations will go on next week about the Iranian program in which the Americans will be sitting just slightly outside the room because President Trump mistakenly, in my view, withdrew from the P5 plus one uh, agreement that China had been part of negotiating with Russia. So I think the we shouldn't be misled by the atmospherics. We should keep looking at underneath all this, what actually is happening. And I think what's happening is an appreciation that this relationship is going to be fiercely competitive because the U.S. would prefer uh, uh, its position, and China would prefer its position, and the relative power of the parties has been changing and will continue to change. So that'll be very difficult. But at the same time, I think both are capable of uh, attending to 
the arenas in which they have shared interests. And I like very much to go back to the earlier suggestion you mentioned, Henry, that uh, China might come to TPP and the U.S. might come back to something like that. That would be a big benefit for both of them and for all of the parties that would, uh, uh, basically, we know that trade agreements that create win-win situations produce a bigger pie for everybody. So uh, on the uh, era of engagement being over, I think that's right. The kind of engagement that we imagined for a generation in which a poor, backward, developing China would essentially follow in American footsteps and for American instruction and take its place in an American-led international order is past. And I don't think that the efforts to try to reconstruct or resurrect anything like that uh, make, uh, make sense. So we're not going to go there. And as to looking forward, I think that basically, uh, I mean, I think it's what we've said before that this is going to be a fierce rivalry and it's going to be a necessary partnership and nobody would necessarily choose either, but both are baked into the conditions that we face. One, the geopolitical conditions that are shifting this seesaw of power. The other, the realities of a 21st century world in which nuclear weapons can destroy us all and in which unconstrained Greenhouse gases can make an unlivable climate. Great, uh, thank, thank you, Graham. You, your advice and uh, uh, concept is really uh, uh, very, very important uh, uh, to, to all of us. And I know that uh, you have many uh, your previous students, your, your former colleagues that are working at the current uh, Biden administration, you being <laughs> frequently consultant. So your, your idea, your wisdom, is, is, going, is needed in both US and China and the world. Uh, of course, I think you, you, you mentioned about three years ago, about 12 uh, uh, coups and the recommendation to how to avoid uh, uh, Haiti's trap. But I think we, we need to continue to talk about that, find a way uh, to this new set of a relationship of uh, uh, you know, co competition, but also cooperation. So uh, uh, a rivalry partnership. Uh, and I think, what, I think the point Chen Li made is extremely important point extremely important. So for most people today, they have no idea what means war. So I find this with students that I, we teach in our executive programs. So they're colonels or they're uh, even new generals. And I say, what means war? Well, war is what happened in Iraq or what happened in Afghanistan. Those are little, little teeny wars. What means real war? Real war. So go back to World War II, you know, 50 million people were killed. So just un unimaginable compared to, uh, and what would mean a nuclear war? A nuclear war could literally mean that Beijing is gone, disappeared. Boston, gone, disappeared. So I think, what? Impossible, no, not impossible, crazy. Uh, hard to imagine, but the physical consequence of a full-scale war between the U.S. and China could actually kill every last Chinese and every last American. And anybody who survived later would say, these people were out of their minds. How did they ever let this happen? How did they? How come they didn't appreciate what a what a danger this was? And if they had thought about it, and then they said, "Well, but something happened in Taiwan, and China did this, and the U.S. did that, and one thing led to the other, and at the end there was a war," they would say, "But did that make any sense? No, it made no sense." In the same way that when people looked at Europe at the end of 1918 when World War I was over, Europe, which had been the centerpiece 
of civilization for 500 years and destroyed itself. So Europe never became a major player in the world again in the way that it had been for the previous 500 years. And why? Because some archduke <laughs> was assassinated by a terrorist and then one thing led to the other and within five weeks, all the nations of Europe were consumed by a war that made no sense. So that the, the, the painful fact about it that Chun Li reminds us, especially for younger people, but that's literally for everybody today. You know, nobody has internalized how horrible real full-scale war is and could be and how insane it would be. So fortunately, fortunately, there's nobody in the Pentagon who believes that war with China is a good idea. Not one single person. And I believe there's not a single person in the PLA who believes that war with the U.S. would be a good idea. So that's good. That's good. But the societies need to understand this. And then even the fact that two parties understand they, that war is not possible, except to, if you're just suicidal, even then, that doesn't mean war can't happen because some spiral of reactions pull you somewhere where you don't want to go. So that then creates a compelling reason for Americans and Chinese at all levels to be talking about dangers that could get out of control and asking, what can we do about this cooperatively with respect to Iran? What can we do about North Korea? What can we do about Taiwan differences? What can we do about patrols in the South China Sea or the East China Sea? So I think across that whole spectrum, if we took seriously uh, Chen Li's point about how damaging war would be, we would be much more motivated to be doing a lot more on that front than we are today. Sorry, that's my last sermon, but we're already way over time here. But, so, but, uh, no, yeah. thank you, thank you, Graham. You, you, you really uh, gave a very good uh, reminder to all of us that live in today because, uh, you know, for the last 75 years, we haven't seen uh, any living beings here. We haven't seen, uh, probably, uh, may, most of us haven't seen a major war. I mean, the war of that magnitude, as you said, you know, mutually assured destruction is absolutely crazy and, uh, and silly and, of course, the madness. So, so, so I think that, that we should really should avoid that. So I'm glad to see we, we had this really productive uh, uh, discussion. Uh, uh, and uh, we actually today are trying to find that way to escape uh, this trap that, uh, that you have proposed this uh, central question for all of us to pondering, to think about. So, so, so we, we discussed about the 12 suggestions you said. We, we even said since now U.S. is uh, uh, working on the infrastructure, China is working on the infrastructure, can we have a World Infrastructure Investment Bank? to taking care of the world infrastructure so that for the next 75 years, we have a, something to work together for. And of course, on climate change that uh, President Biden invited President Xi to a John Earth Day Summit, uh, which you said uh, on, on the, the public going to uh, both leading the G20 group, being the two largest uh, polluters of the world, we have to uh, set good examples on that uh, to work together. And, and pandemic fighting as well. We have, uh, even though we have had a world Third World War, we had the World Virus War, which is also uh, devastating. The trade and prosperity can keep us uh, out of the war and intertwined uh, uh, become uh, like, uh, like uh, uh, Thomas Friedman said, one country, two system, <laughs> or three country, two, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, one country, three system, whatever. So, so I think, you know, there's a lot of recommendations uh, that we really want to work on. I, I, you're, you're right. I mean, when Biden and, uh, and Obama uh, John Kerry told me at uh, Munich uh, Security Conference we, when we had that event together, Graham, that uh, you know they will actually invite China to join the Paris Peace Accord. You are right. If China and the U.S. agreed on the Paris Accord, the Paris Accord is there. So, so we both countries have to work together on that, and uh, we have a more responsibility for that. And I, I think we have to find a way to, you know, get out of that. And President Xi was really forthcoming by committing at the UN summit that China going to achieve carbon neutral before, not by, before 2060. So, so that uh, already we have a lot of uh, 
uh, you know, uh, give exchanges there. So, so I really think so. So because I, I think that we are, we are running out of time, <laughs> and, and really, I really appreciate that we have over one million viewers uh, to take, take part in our uh, watching, listening. Uh, so you see uh, how attractive you are. Uh, uh, I want to thank you very much for your taking your time out of your busy schedule. I mean, you are coaching so many uh, U.S. Uh, 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 executives and uh, policymakers. Uh, you're widely sorted uh, opinion world opinion leader these days, uh, and your your uh, idea will be so uh, uh, stimulating to all of us to think about uh, global peace and prosperity. And also want to thank uh, Professor Li Cheng, a young scholar, which uh, has uh, also uh, carry on the study of <laughs> how to avoid the military conflict, how to uh, avoid uh, hit his trap. So uh, on behalf of the Center for China Globalization, I want to thank Graham. Uh, Professor uh, Chen Li, and also, of course, our greater audience uh, today for joining us. So, so we'll end here, but I don't think this is the last one. We'll have a chance to uh, invite Graham again in the future. So thank you all very much. I hope you have a good evening and good morning. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. Thank you, Professor Li.